Let's pray before we read the word together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word, which gives us direction, Lord, at a time when uh, it's lacking uh, all around us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that when others are perturbed, we don't need to be because we can uh, trust in you. Uh, Lord, but we want to uh, listen to all you have to say to us this morning, Lord. Uh, we want to submit our lives and our wills to you again, uh, that you might have uh, full uh, dominion over them, Lord, and that you might uh, be pleased to use us, Lord, uh, at this time, Lord, when so much is happening, Lord, that you would work in us and use us for your purposes. So we pray as we come to your word, Lord, that we would come with that right attitude, Lord, and uh, that we would be eager, Lord, to receive food from you, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's read Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten <coughs> strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsels of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. That psalm has meant a lot to me uh, in the past few days. We're not just going to be in there this morning, but that's where we're going to start um, I read it on the uh, night of the referendum, in other words, the, on the Thursday night when the votes had all been cast and were going to be counted. And I knew I was going to wake up in the morning because I wasn't one of those crazy people who decided to stay up all the way through the night. Um, I knew I was going to wake up in the morning, uh, turn on, um, go on some news website and straight away find out um, whether uh, we had been kept in the EU or brought out and as many of you uh, would have felt as well and um, of course I was delighted by uh, the results um, I appreciate that not everybody was and perhaps some maybe even listen to the recording might not have been uh, but we're going to look at briefly why we were delighted but before the referendum results I read this psalm and it was so helpful because I thought you know what this speaks whatever the result this psalm uh, speaks of comfort uh, for example, verse four, um, for the word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. That was going to be a comfort to me if we had stayed in, knowing that, OK, we would have been disappointed, but the Lord's work is right. Uh, and we were to praise him, as those first few verses say, um, whatever happened, we were to praise him. Uh, so I felt this was really helpful. It quieted me uh, and enabled me uh, to get at least a little bit of sleep. That night, uh, I can't say I slept fully, but uh, I got a bit of sleep uh, knowing that whatever the result, I could praise the Lord and everything was in his control. And of course, many of us uh, rejoiced at the result 
Um, and I'm aware that uh, some people do listen to these recordings, so even if uh, all of us here are, are agreed, and uh, some of us might not be, uh, briefly just to remind uh, ourselves of the, the reasons why as Christians we were delighted with that result. Uh, of course, many Christians weren't, but uh, as Christians here, uh, we believe uh, for a start that uh, EU laws have led to prosecutions uh, of many Christians uh, for sharing their faith. And um, we want to see a reversal of that. Uh, that lack of sovereignty, although it's been debated how much sovereignty we have, um, there is that uh, seeming lack of sovereignty uh, over uh, in our nation. And in the Bible, being ruled over by other nations is always seen as a bad thing. It's always seen, uh, especially when it's been allowed by the Lord, it's always seen as a judgment in some way. Um, that when nations have done wrong, the Lord brings them under the power of another nation. So we therefore felt it was wrong, uh, sorry, it was a bad thing to be uh, not fully sovereign ourselves. Uh, many of us uh, felt that the Lord allowed us to come under the power of the EU because of our sins uh, as a nation. Um, abortion and uh, uh, going our own way with uh, relationships and sex are probably two of the biggest problems in our nation. But lots of us, uh, as well as just each of us in our own lives, generally around the nation, turning from the Lord. Um, so as Christians, we felt the Lord brought us into the EU as a judgment uh, and therefore we would want not to stay under that judgment if the Lord could bring us out. And also uh, some pictures in the Bible, uh, many feel talk about the EU uh, and they're not good pictures. And uh, we don't have time to talk about that, but uh, there is a booklet, I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, a booklet which uh, obviously uh, Dave and I have been produced. Uh, I think there are many copies there going for a discount price now. Now the, the, they were free, now they're even freer. Um, because the referendum has passed. Please do look at that uh, or get in touch if you want one. But those are some of the reasons as Christians we were glad. Besides any personal reasons, uh, national pride or different other things, those were the reasons that we as believers uh, were happy. And basically this morning what I want to ask is what should our response be now to the referendum? apologise if you've heard enough of the referendum by now. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to hear a lot more about it over the coming years, so we might as well get used to it, I guess. Um, but what should our response be now? Because some of you may have seen online or it heard in person a lot of uh, anger and frustration and abuse mm -hmm. and different other things, which we'll touch on, um, of other people. And that's their reaction to this. What should our reaction to the result be as Christians not that I claim to have perfect knowledge of that at all, but um, just to give some thoughts and suggestions, what should our response be? And if you agree uh, with what we've said about it being a good result, our first reaction should be praise, mm. shouldn't it? Which is why we're starting in this psalm. As I've already said in verse 4, it says, The word of the Lord is right and all his work is done in truth. Whatever the result, we needed to be ready to praise the Lord. Um, but when we see the Lord's work and the Lord's hand uh, bringing us out in a way which we probably wouldn't have thought possible otherwise, um, it gives us cause to praise the Lord for his work and for his mercy. It says in verse six, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. It's good to remember how powerful the Lord is at a time when there is so much uncertainty. To remember that not only has the Lord been able to uh, give us this initial deliverance, but that he is able, as we seek him and pray to him, he is able to bring us through it, to steer us uh, individually but to steer the nation through this difficult time and if it's his will as we seek him he can bring us into prosperity mm. I can't say that he's definitely going to but we know he can yeah. because it says here that by the Lord's word the heavens were made <coughs> he spoke and the world came into being with that power the Lord can speak and make our land either blessed or cursed mm. he can speak and that can happen so we don't need to fear 
as we see all the predictions of doom uh, and as we see the worries all around us, we don't need to worry about it because we can come to the Lord and the Lord can deliver us and can um, bring those suggestions of what's going to happen that's going to go wrong to nothing if it's his will. It says, actually, verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. You know, all those schemes and plans of man to keep us in the EU were brought to nothing. All of that effort, all of those reports and predictions and statistics, I'm not saying the other side were any better. Uh, The Leave campaign was also uh, riddled with problems in different ways. Um, But all of those plans that man had to keep us in and all the fear was brought to nothing. So many people and organisations and governments uh, tried to keep us in. Our own government, uh, our other EU governments, the US government uh, tried to intervene. Uh, Various economic bodies brought their weight to bear, uh, their weight, whatever weight it is. Uh, The political figures from the past all lined up to tell us what we should do. Business owners, even celebrities, David Beckham. At the last moment, uh, brought his weight to bear, uh, you know, various different celebrities. Uh, Week after week, we heard these scare stories. But that whole regime of fear could not have kept us in if the Lord decreed that we were going to come out. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. He is more powerful than all of those things put together. Even if every single voice in the world had been telling us to stay in, the Lord was able to bring us out. And we believe he has done. So we don't need to fear now when these things are brought out. Because as the Lord has brought those things to nothing for this result, the Lord can bring those things to nothing continually. He is able to. There's a related verse in Isaiah 8, if you just turn there. Isaiah 8 and verse 9. Isaiah 8 and verse 9. As is verse 10 really. Where it says, Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. If God is with us, who can be against us? If the Lord was going to be on our side, there was nothing that could stop it. And that should give us courage for the future. And just as he brought the plans of the side uh, to keep us into nothing beforehand, he can bring to nothing any wrong plans of the nations in the negotiations that are going to come up. Again, if it's his will, and we must emphasise that. We can't assume that just because the Lord has allowed this victory that therefore we're suddenly going to go into a land of milk and honey. We don't know. But we can pray that the Lord would bring to nothing Any plans that would uh, cause problems for our nation. But you know, in verse 11, it brings us on to another aspect. We've said about the need to respond in praise and to rejoice. Um, And actually, just before we move on, I I think it's it's worth saying, uh, as some of you may have felt, that when uh, when we first saw that result, I'm sure a lot of us were ecstatic. But for me, as I saw the reactions all around... And I saw all the fear and negativity. I must admit, I started to lose some of that joy. And I began to feel a bit heavy. Uh, And I began to feel a bit, maybe not fearful, but certainly apprehensive about uh, what was going to come in the coming days. Um, And I was losing some of that joy that I had at the start. I think that's one reason, another reason why it's good to meet together, isn't it, to have fellowship. I was lifted in the worship time this morning as we rejoiced because you know um, we can have uh, all of these opposing voices in the world but when we come together with like-minded people we can remind each other no this is good news Mm -hmm. whatever people say we have a God who can deliver us we have had an amazing deliverance and we can rejoice in it Mm -hmm. so it's good to come together as often as we can isn't it because we can be lifted in those things Uh, And we should go on encouraging each other and uh, we should look out for each other and whether online or in person, if we see that people are starting to get down about this and they're believers, we should say, no, look up. 
Be encouraged. Remember our God. But it says in verse 11, another aspect. It says, For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary. We're not to walk in the way of the people around us. We're not to walk in the way even of other Christians who are being perturbed by these things. We're not to be spreading messages of fear. We're not to be accepting them. Um, I should just explain because I know some of you, uh, you may you may not be on Facebook or these other things or um, you may not have uh, friends who are um, really against all that's happened. Um, but just to, just to give a, a brief idea, um, the, the vast majority of people I know uh, who I see on Facebook and who I uh, see sharing their thoughts were massively against what happened. Um, some were very abusive towards uh, Leave voters. Um, I, I had some saying, uh, I wonder if they would have supported Hitler. Uh, I had some, uh, one person talking about, effectively implying they're looking forward to when the generation dies out that voted us out. Uh, because people see that it's mainly the older generation that wanted to come out, so they're looking forward to, to them dying out. Charming. Um, there were uh, people calling us idiots, and I've rephrased the word to make it a bit more uh, friendly, but uh, basically idiots, uh, and various other things. Uh, there were people saying uh, the worst day in Britain's history, uh, and uh, saying they wanted to leave, uh, saying people who wanted to leave when the, the Conservative government got in again, but there we go. Um, you know, there was just such, there was such venom and such anger. This is the way, uh, and, and don't, don't discuss it now, guys, but this is the way which the people are walking right now. People are walking in anger and hatred and abject fear and despair. We are not to walk in that way. And of course, in uh, Isaiah's time, there was a lot of fear and there were a lot of problems. There was a lot of judgment both coming, that had come and that was coming. And the Lord says to Isaiah, who could have been carried away with it all, and perhaps, perhaps was being at this time, we don't know. The Lord says, don't walk that way. Don't be one of them. Let the Lord be your fear. We are not to be afraid of people's threats. We're not to be troubled by all the turbulence, but we are to fear the Lord. We are to hallow him. Because it's him, it's the Lord who holds our future. It's the Lord who holds the faith of the nation. Whatever other people say, we can in a sense to some extent ignore because we know the Lord will have the last word. But the Lord can decide in a moment to bring our nation to nothing or to plant us and build us up. So it's the Lord who we should have our eyes on and who we should be praying to and who we should fear in a right way. We need to remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24 when he predicted various things that were going to happen, uh, things that were going to be difficult. And the Lord specifically and clearly said to his disciples, see that you are not troubled. See that you are not troubled. We mustn't allow the world's fear to taint our thoughts. And also we mustn't let it silence us. Uh, various people commented online that uh, if there were 52% of voters who voted leave, where are they all now? Where are they all speaking? Uh, you didn't see many people uh, happy at the result, even though we know there must have been a lot of people happy. So many were cowered into silence by the power of the things that other people were saying. Now, I'm not saying that we should be all political necessarily. We need to ask the Lord to lead us as to what we should say. But we shouldn't be silenced from proclaiming the truth. And if we feel the Lord saying that we should share something, whether online or in person, sorry that I often push it towards online because that's where I do a lot of conversation. But 
whether we're online or in person, we should not be silenced mm -hmm. from saying what we feel is from the Lord to share with other people, whatever people might say. So we've had the need to rejoice. We've had the need not to be troubled, but to fear the Lord. But there's a very serious need as well, not to sit back, but to pray and to go on praying. Amen. Turn to Nehemiah in chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. As we often uh, do when there's a difficult situation, uh, I was uh, really trying to think about are there parallels in scripture with the situation we find ourselves in as a nation now? Uh, and very often there aren't perfect parallels. Uh, I wouldn't claim there are for this situation. But I was interested to remember something uh, in Nehemiah. We're just going to um, just pick our way through um, a few parts of this. Nehemiah 8 and verse 1. Now bear in mind that at this point, uh, after being uh, removed from Israel and scattered into the nations and enslaved under Babylon uh, for a, a large amount of time, that a small amount of Israelites who had survived had been brought back to the nation. So in a sense, they were in a similar position that the Lord had shown some mercy to them. The Lord had started something of a restoration as the Lord, we believe, has started something of a restoration in this nation that we need to pray he will continue. But the Lord has started something there. And in Nehemiah 8 and verse 1, it says all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And it goes on to say that they listened attentively from morning until midday. Now, of course, that'd be amazing uh, if as a church, particularly and as well as a nation, that we would gather together as one man in this time to hear from the Lord. But that's the first thing we see recorded here that they do uh, as a group of people. And then in verse nine, uh, it says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, again, I wouldn't want to push this parallel too much, but it's interesting that they said at the start, this is a time for rejoicing. Mm. This is a time, although there are problems and there's still all kinds of things going on and there's things we need to get right over. This is a time to rejoice and praise the Lord for what he has done. But then in the next chapter, Nehemiah 9. It says in verse one, now on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners. And they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities <coughs> of their fathers. And then it goes on to document a very long prayer. Uh, led by some of the uh, people there uh, and uh, a prayer basically acknowledging the Lord's goodness, uh, acknowledging the land's sin and the Lord's right judgment. And then in verse 36, it says, here we are servants today and the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty. Here we are servants in it and it yields much increase to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure. And we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites and our priests seal it. I just think it's a very interesting situation we see here that first of all, they get the perspective from the word of the Lord. And they rejoice at what the Lord has done. And then soon afterwards, they recognise that there are still problems and they confess their sins and pray uh, to the Lord. That there are both of those things there, a recognition of what the Lord has already done and a praying for mercy because there is still more to do. 
And I think that is uh, very important. And it's interesting to see they make a, a covenant, uh, a covenant really to serve the Lord and, and to put right the things that weren't right before. The Israelites recognise that although the Lord has given them the start of a deliverance and brought them into uh, the land again, that they're still not free, that they're still not under the Lord's full blessing, and that there are still sins they need to confess and put right. You know, we have seen the Lord's mercy uh, in, uh, in various ways, including uh, this recent referendum. But we've got to be careful not to think uh, that because we've been delivered or started to be delivered, that therefore the Lord is really pleased with us. Uh, we shouldn't think that suddenly the Lord has changed and said, well, so far you've been under judgment, but now everything's changed and everything's going to be rosy. We shouldn't think that because we don't know uh, what, how the Lord sees us other than that there is still a lot of sin in our land. I believe the Lord has heard our cries as a church, uh, not, not just this church, but as a church in the nation, as many have woken up and prayed more than ever before, that the Lord has heard us. But there is still so much to do. There is still so much sin in our land and so many reasons that the Lord could stop what he has begun to do. Especially if we become complacent now. As the Israelites did once the Lord brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the land. And as soon as the Lord had planted them that they forsook him. We have prayed so much for this day to come. And now this day has come. Let's not go to sleep. Let's not get in a position where we say, oh, what a relief, we can stop praying now. Because there's much to pray for. What is there to pray for? Well, apart from the general things which we would always pray for and the general sins we need to confess, specifically, for a start, our exit from the EU is not a done deal. It is not a certain thing as much as we would like to see it to be. I've already seen a number of articles where people are putting forward the ways in which the MPs of our land could uh, deny what we've done and say, well, that's what the people have said, but our job is to protect the nation and we think we should stay in. So we know that it's possible that that could happen. And we need to pray that the Lord would ensure that the will of the people is respected. Mm-hmm. There's already been one P- MP, at least, that has called specifically for the MPs of the go- and the government to ignore what the people have said. There's already been at least one, perhaps more. We also need to pray for right leaders and right decisions in the negotiations that are to come. Uh, We need to pray for the right prime minister, the right government generally. Um, We don't know if there'll be a general election soon. We need to pray for the timing of that if it happens and for the right result. We need to pray for the right team to come together to negotiate. We need to pray for all the discussions that happen. Uh, even for the leaders of the other countries, that they would be fair. We're told to pray for the leaders, for everyone in authority, aren't we? Not just our own nations. Um, We need to uh, pray um, that the EU leaders make the right decision in what to do next. Uh, I read a quote that said, um, the EU leaders now need to decide whether to use this as an opportunity for deeper integration or to view it as a wake-up call and create more flexibility within the union. In other words, it's a turning point now and the EU leaders need to decide, are we going to use this to push for everybody getting closer and closer, or are we going to use it to say, okay, we need to change? Now, I'll be completely honest, I don't know how to pray then. I know that sounds strange. I don't know what the Lord's will is uh, for the EU and how he's going to use it in his purposes, but we need to pray that whatever his will is, that it will be done in those discussions but we also need to pray for healing for our bitterly divided and fearful nation bitterly divided there were deep and hurtful divisions between the two camps and as i've said already specifically between old and young generations uh, in the minds of many and that's a problem because we're to respect the older generation aren't we um uh if we're not in it, of course. Um, we need to uh, respect those who are older and their wisdom. And we see a lack of that right now. Um, we see many people who, whether they say it or not, want that older generation gone. And that is not a healthy situation. Uh, as I read in an article recently, God promises in two chronicles, amongst other things, to heal the land. If we humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face 
and turn from our evil ways. Yes, that was spoken to Israel, but I believe it can be true for our nation as well. If we turn, the Lord is able to heal some of those divisions. And we need to pray that he will. A related passage spoke to me in Ezra 9. If you'll turn with me to Ezra 9. Of course, Ezra being at the same time period as Nehemiah um, in various ways. It's that same situation of Israel being brought back to the land. In uh, Ezra 9, we see a situation where uh, there has been uh, rejoicing, of course, that the Israelites have been brought back. But then the leaders come to Ezra and tell him that the peoples have not separated themselves. That's the people of Israel had not separated themselves from the peoples of the land. And that was a problem because the Lord had specifically said for the Israelites not to mix with other nations so that they would stay faithful to him. And we see Ezra's reaction at this. Uh, in verse 3, that he, he tore his garment and his robe, uh, plucked out some of the hair of his head and beard, as they did at that time. I'm not advocating this, by the way. Um, and, uh, and sat down astonished. And it says, Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to Ezra. So they recognised at this point that though there had been that mercy shown, that there was a serious problem that needed to be dealt with. And we're not time to read the whole prayer that Ezra prays, but just to pick out that he falls on his knees in verse 5. In verse 6, he says he is too ashamed and humiliated to lift up his face to the Lord. He recognises that although the Lord's been good to them, that they still should be ashamed. He says that their iniquities have risen higher than our heads and their guilt grown up to the heavens. In verse 8 it says, now for a little while grace has been shown from the Lord our God. And it says that he had given them a measure of revival in their bondage. I thought that really spoke to me. Uh, You've got to be careful how we use that word revival. Um, But the Lord in a sense has given us the start perhaps of a measure of revival. A revival of something of where our nation should be. Um, Perhaps is opening that door. Um, And yet, as Ezra acknowledges then, despite the Lord doing that, and in verse 13, the Lord not having punished their, the Lord having punished their iniquities less than they deserved. He then says in verse 14, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant or survivor? Ezra recognises that although the Lord has started to plant Israel again, if they continue in this sin that he has discovered, the Lord could just as easily make an end of them. Are we getting too concerned there? Is that really, would the Lord really do that to us? Well, the Lord says something very clear in Jeremiah 18. In Jeremiah 18 and verse 5. Jeremiah 18 and verse 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant, it's a powerful phrase, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, pull down and destroy it, If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I fought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Of course, that's a very encouraging verse in some ways, passage, but also a very challenging one. To remind ourselves, whatever good the Lord may have spoken for us at this time, to remember that we need to go on and to ask the Lord to cleanse us of our sins and ask the Lord to begin to put things right uh, that he is not pleased with so that he will not relent from the goodness he started to show. 
So we said that we need to rejoice in what the Lord has done. We said we don't need to be troubled. We said we mustn't sit back, but pray. And one final thing, very briefly. This victory that the Lord has given us should give us hope in our prayers. Both for the nation and for other situations. If the Lord was utterly finished with our nation, if he was completely displeased with us to the point where he would no longer show us mercy, we wouldn't have voted to come out. I don't believe. And the very fact that he has shown that mercy shows he is willing to hear us. It reminds us that he has heard our cries, that all of those prayers we have prayed, some of us, not me, but some of us, praying perhaps for 40 years for this to happen, the Lord has heard. We may be in dire straits as a nation, but there's a chink of light. There's a light there at the end of the tunnel. If we keep praying for that mercy from the Lord. As Ezra put it, the Lord had given a measure of revival. We need to pray for more of it. And it should spur us on to think that many have prayed for 40 years and have had this result. Spur us on in our prayers personally. For people who we prayed for. Family and friends perhaps who we prayed for years that they would come to know the Lord. Situations we struggle with for years where we've asked the Lord to take it away or to deal with it. That even if it may go on for 40 years, that the Lord hears the prayers and when it's his timing, he can act. That should give us encouragement. Well, to close, let's briefly turn back to Psalm 33 to look at something right at the end. In Psalm 33. Psalm 33 and verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Friends, the eye of the Lord is on us now. The eye of the Lord is on us individually and as a church. To see what our response is going to be. To see if we're going to go on along with the world and be fearful and not trust him. Or if we're going to hope, as it says here, to hope in his mercy. Are we going to fear the Lord and him only? As it says there, he is able to deliver us. Uh, even if there's a famine uh, in some way in our land, even if there's a problem, he is able to deliver us. And he is able to deliver our nation. The eye of the Lord is on us. He's looking to see what is our response going to be. Are we going to have that fear of him and that hope in that mercy of the Lord? He is able to help us. Let's have that hope in him. Let's be those who please him now as all the rest of the world goes crazy. Let's be those who please the Lord as we walk firmly and stand firm in him. Let's have a moment of quiet before we pray. Dear Lord, we praise and thank you, Lord, for um, the words of encouragement that we can get from these things, Lord. To be reminded that there is hope, Lord. Lord, as long as you are hearing prayer, there is hope. And we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for your help, Lord. Um, you see the things which we've said this morning. And we pray, Lord, that those things that are right, that you would bury deep into our hearts, Lord. We pray for your help to be a light, Lord. As all around us is going, uh, as I said, going crazy, Lord. We pray that we would be light and salt. And Lord, would please you in our reactions, Lord. Help us not to get carried away. Help us not to get bogged down, but to rejoice, but also to pray. We cry to you for the church in our nation, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the ways in which we saw some who had never really prayed before joining in at this time. Please, Lord, may we not go back to normal. May more and not less be spurred on to pray now. Mm. And we cry to you for our nation. Lord, you see our nation. It is broken, Lord. Lord, it is divided, Lord. It is threatened from all sides, Lord. 
But we thank you you've delivered us before. You can deliver us again. And we cry to you, would you finish the work you have begun? Lord, would you bring us out completely of this system? Would you bring us out for your gospel, Lord? And would you begin to deal with some of the things that displease you in our nation, Lord? That we might again be something more of a pleasing nation to you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.